Ashton, I first saw you, it was introduced to you through the Ian Carroll program that you went on. And I thought you did an awesome job and I always enjoy what he has to say. And it kind of led me down this path where I was checking out more of the appearances you've made in the last, let's call it a couple months or even maybe a year at this point. And the next one that I watched after Ian Carroll was the Danny Jones program. And I made it through like two and a half hours of this guy's three hour podcast. And in the last half hour, he kind of blindsides you. And he brings out this video that he clearly had pre-recorded by these, this guy, uh, Nico of the Corridor crew. And I guess they're visual, uh, visual effects experts. I've never heard of them, but that's why I reached out to you. And I wanted to say, hey, I don't feel you got a fair shake at the end of that video. I want you to come on this program and kind of walk us through what they were saying, why it's kind of, to me, sounded a little bit like BS and really just start from there. So thank you, Ashton, for coming on Elevated Thoughts. Um, do you want to give a brief introduction and kind of tell some of our listeners who you are? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, so my name is Ashton Forbes. Uh, I've been a healthcare consultant, uh, IT consultant my whole life, almost 20 years. And I had never thought I would be in the position that I'm in right now with respect to having this big social media following and uh, disclosing technology that I either call high technology or forbidden technology that's out there, which is technology that the United States government has in special access programs that has been kept secret from the public that's so advanced that it actually just seems like magic to us. Um, and it, it's kind of all started with uh, what I, I referred to as the MH370 videos. That's where I guess you know people know me from at this point. I was never really a conspiracy guy. I was never really a, a UFO guy either, although I think my interest was peaked in 2017 when those DOD Navy uh, drone videos were, were leaked, or actually I, I think they're just FLIR videos in general were leaked, and then they were uh, declassified officially by the government. And ever since then, I've just been watching along. And um, when I saw these videos come out and the investigation dig into them, I thought, wow, these are these are crazy videos. Like there was a lot of corroborating evidence that these could be legitimate. Uh, so that's when I started MH370X. I just put an X at the end of it and said, <laughs> you know, this is going to be the crossover between the MH370 case, the videos and the potential understanding of the technology. Um, so since then, since uh, August of 2023, uh, I've become you know a social media influencer, I guess you could say, uh, investigating the videos, uh, all the evidence around the videos, uh, everything around the MH370 investigation. I would say that uh, I'm definitely up there with the top investigative experts into the plane, mis disappearance of the plane. And then the triple threat is the science side of it as well. I've been, uh, started my own podcast, have been interviewing uh, engineers, scientists, and physicists, um, people like Salvatore Paez, who is a Navy engineer, active one, who has several patents that are uh, considered UFO patents because they're so extraordinary. Um, other people like Bob Greenier, who's into low energy nuclear reactions, uh, as well as uh, my good friend Dave Rossi, who's a DOD contractor and engineer as well. Um, and then physicist Roy D. Herbert. And I plan to do more podcasts in the future. It's just been really busy. So, um, you know, in the end, what I want people to know is that uh, I believe that those videos are 100% authentic, and I think that they're potentially the biggest uh, military leak in all of history uh, because of the magnitude and significance related to them. So I look forward to talking to you and your audience today about you know everything related to it and answering any questions openly that you might you know have or you might think they had. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I kind of have been on Twitter for three years or five years. I lost track now. But for the last four years since the 2020 election, and I was kind of telling you in the uh, pre-show lobby there, I've been kind of known as a human encyclopedia on election fraud. And it's a tough world to live in because you really get blackballed by a lot of people if you kind of say <laughs> the wrong thing. Um, but at the same time, there's huge legitimate concerns surrounding a topic like that. So with something like yours, and if no one knows what MH370 is, it was in 2014, this dis disappearance of a plane that left Malaysia heading to China. There's no understanding of where it went nor what happened to it. Uh, so that's the kind of stuff that Ashton is looking into. But what I was saying is in this election world, you kind of go down these rabbit holes and you fight like hell to prove what you're saying is real. And then what happens is you just live in this state of dismay, right? Four years later in the United States, I don't know what's happened to secure the elections. Um, in fact, I kind of talk with Mike about this every week. I don't have the best hope as the right wing guy that that's going to work out for us. Um, but it shows that there is different levels to things like this where you could be fully bought in, you could be kind of bought in, um, but also it's important to have a guy like you who's kind of the figurehead because 
if I dare say that, right? I think Ian called you the tip of the spear on these videos because it's someone that's able to kind of parse through the information. Um, and just to give you like this quick example, right? Pro people have probably heard about ballots and suitcases getting carried around. It turns out that's not accurate. Those were real ballot boxes. But you have a lot of people in the election integrity world continuing to say they're moving around suitcases of ballots. And I always tell those folks it takes away. It takes away from the story that we're telling. It takes away from the legitimacy or the veracity of our claims. So. Ashton, that's where I wanted to start. What is one of the claims that you hear probably every day that you're like, guys, I get it, I like it, right? Maybe it's, oh, this was done by aliens, because I think you don't necessarily think it's done by aliens, right? So what's the biggest thing that you want to say to your supporters that believe what you're saying and say, hey, guys, let's take, let's pump the brakes on this one? I think that you, you're right. The aliens thing is, is a big one. It was bigger in the beginning because, and I, and I totally understand. I, I thought it had to be aliens the first week or so when I looked at those videos. You look at how absolutely foreign and exotic uh, the videos look with respect to these orbs spinning around the plane, this perfect triangle formation, and then the plane is just zap, gone, an, an endothermic event, which is an absorption of energy. And it's taken like months to realize that that's probably the first ever humanly recorded endothermic event that's been shown to the public ever out there. It's essentially equivalent to a wormhole, in, according to some scientific papers. So when you look at that, you go, oh, this can't be human technology. I mean, that's the first reaction that people have. Even the people that are the detractors say, oh, Ashton thinks the plane was zapped by aliens. But if they had listened to me after the first week, they would have realized that, like, I, the more I looked at those videos, the more I realized, like, this is something that was being expected. Like, this is a United States General Atomics drone filming this plane. They're filming it before the orbs ever show up. This would indicate that they knew something was going to happen. It's an operation. In fact, Chris Leto, before I ever met him personally, uh, he did a, a video recording, a, like a analysis of those videos very briefly. And he was like, this looks like, you know, some type of, of an operation or an experiment or a test, weapons test, because of how the drone is flying so close to the plane. Mm. Almost tailing, and, right? Because it kind of curves. Yeah, up. it's almost tailing. It goes yeah, underneath the, the wake, and there's really actually like a little it. bit of, like, shake for the, uh, when it goes underneath the wake there as well. Although these drones are, like, very highly stabilized, you can actually see the camera shake a little bit. Um, and that's where you start to realize, like, whoa, this is, this is like, unless, like, the aliens are, are working with the United States government, like, this is a United States government operation going on here. Um, and then the more you dig into the science, it, while it seems unexplainable at first, like a lot of people just say, well, this, we, can't po we can't possibly explain what we see right there. And that's why they think it's got to be aliens. But the more you look into it, you realize it can be explained. And this, the science that's been suppressed from us goes back maybe all the way back to the 1940s or before. Like the Philadelphia experiment was 1943. That might have been the first time we learned that uh, electromagnetic fields can actually bend space time. Mm. And if that's true, then we've been advancing it slowly for the last 80 years. Um, and it could go back, people say it might go back to the Nazi bell. I haven't really dug into all of that. But I get, what I am confident of is that having talked to the engineers and, and watched many other videos from people like Thomas Bearden, and I was watching another one by Paul Size the other day, who was a 30 year aeronautical engineer uh, with the government. Like we have this technology out there. It's just that the public has no idea. And I think that's what makes it so difficult is that people don't realize that even the government's struggling with the idea of how do we tell people this because they've become so far advanced beyond what the public is that it just seems like Harry Potter magic to us at this point. Us muggles couldn't possibly handle it. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. I think that I, I truly think that, you know, I initially started going into the UFO community with this information because I thought that was the right community. And then I realized even the UFO community has no idea. And I think that a lot of the people that are like these – you know, uh, pseudo celebrities of the UFO community, either they just they don't comprehend the magnitude of the technology, or they themselves are being controlled in some kind of like slow drip acclimation where like we slowly get people comfortable with it. And it wouldn't surprise me if even movies are being like fed information behind the scenes, like, you know, Christopher Nolan or something like that, being like, okay, here, Interstellar, put to put time dilation in here so that people understand what time dilation is all about. Or you know, maybe the next movie is going to have something about wormholes in it, you know, and then we're going to go, oh, crap, Ashton was talking about it in those videos, right? Because they want people to get comfortable with the idea. Yeah. Um, You're reminding and, and me. Because it, it breaks people's the, minds. The, the Obamas just put out that movie um, on Netflix about the, the digital attacks and kind of how we're heading to world war. And they dropped leaflets from the sky, which is what we're seeing in Israel and Gaza. I mean, I do think that the media is kind of in touch here, kind of putting forward little feelers to say, here's what you might expect. I, I want to go back to one thing you said, and you, you brought up the United States government technology. When I look at this and 
actually, I want you to talk a little bit too about the Netflix documentary that came out in 2023, because that was just last year. Maybe that's a little bit of, you know, confusion or propaganda in a way. But you had mentioned the U.S. government. So this is a flight from Malaysia to China. Uh, they involved the Australians in terms of locating it. Where the heck does the U.S. government come into this story? Yeah, great question on that. And so the reason why Australia became the de facto lead was because they ha there's very little centralized um, uh, government authority with respect to Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. between Malaysia, Thailand, etc. So kind of Australia somehow gets the lead on this, even though it's a Malaysian flight, Boeing's an American company, it's flying to Beijing and China. That, that should give people pause right away. It's like, why, why, is, why are the Five Eyes controlling every aspect of this? Why is the United States government they have one person on this plane, one adult passenger and like a couple of children who are technically adult American citizens. You know, why are they leading all this? Why was the White House calling Malaysia every single day? Not, not like the Secretary of Defense or like State. It was like the White House was calling them. Okay. And why was it that the United States intelligence services were the ones that told the media to push the idea that the plane went into the South Indian Ocean like five days after the whole world's wondering what five days later? Then they're like, oh, uh, throw out this idea of the plane going to the South Indian Ocean. Um, these should be giving people major pause because if this was a situation where this plane crashed in the ocean somewhere, there might be people on a raft somewhere. And in five days to start pushing that information out is very suspect. Yeah. The company Inmarsat, they came up with these satellite pings right. that were used to point to the South Indian Ocean. Um, they are actually also heavily tied to United States intelligence. Like many of the people on the board of directors are like former military in the United and States. And just to be clear, that's well. the satellite that was kind of pinging the plane in its last moments Correct. before it went down. And this is where they're saying, hey, wait a minute. We thought you were over Malaysia or Vietnam. You're actually here over the Maldives, essentially. Yeah, so the way it went was actually it started that they were searching South China Sea where the plane went dark. And this is the thing, too. Like people don't even realize, like, what even, where did the plane go dark? What happened to it? And at the real time when we were watching, we didn't understand either. Because the first report said this plane lost contact with air traffic control at 1840 UTC. And then we find out a day later, they're like, no, actually, the plane went dark at 1721 UTC. And we're like, wait, that's an hour and 20 minutes earlier. So what's, where, why the gap here? And people had no idea what was going on. So they're searching the South China Sea, or at least they're telling us they are. And then a few days later, five days of searching, they go, oh, no, actually, just kidding. This plane flew over the peninsula of, of Malaysia, right over it, and then went to the, directly to the closest airport, Penang, which is where you would go in an emergency situation. Uh, and then it flew out into the Straits of Malacca and the Andaman Sea, which is northwest of that airport, uh, towards the Nicobar Islands. And then that's where then they searched there for several days. And that's after five days, they said, oh, this plane went to the South Indian Ocean. So many people just assumed it flew directly over Indonesia, which is southwest of Malaysia, because that's a direct route to get to the um, South Indian Ocean. And it wasn't until May 27th, uh, 2020, 2014, where this Immersat data was re released, actually. Before that, there was just this graph of like, lines like this that nobody could interpret and people thought like what did they do to this because no one can make any sense of it um and that's when they realized that no this plane went to the nicobar islands and then took this like 270 degree cut cut back and then went down into the south indian ocean um and the reason why that date is important is that date is eight days after the first mh370 video was released and that first video is called satellite video airliner and ufos and in it, we can see coordinates in the bottom left, satellite coordinates uh, of, of like somebody looking down on like Google Earth, accurate to six decimal places. And those coordinates shift, so we were actually able to map it out and confirm beyond any doubt that that's the Nicobar Islands in that video. For months, we were sitting there thinking like, this has gotta be the South Indian Ocean somehow because that's what all the narratives said. You know, right. I believed all the narratives. And then we find out based on the fact that in both videos, the plane's turning to the left, yeah. That means that there had to be the Nicobar Islands because you could you could graph it out and you can confirm that that's got to be where it is. And so you realize, like, holy crap, how would a person who made this video know that this is the real location where the plane turned into the South Indian Ocean? And then you realize, holy crap, the plane never went into the South Indian Ocean. Like what we're seeing in those videos is what really happened to the plane. And the way we can prove that and actually just today, literally just today, um, and now this, there was a scientific report that was published in Nature on May 2nd. So it was several weeks ago, but you know how this stuff works. 
sure, and they sure. looked at all the acoustic data uh, for their two different hydrophones that are down there. One's on off the coast of Western Australia, and one's in Diego Garcia. And the search efforts, like somewhere in between there, the seventh arc, where the satellite pings say it crashed, there are no acoustic detections that match a 777 crashing into the ocean. And they did the math as well to show that 100% there would be an acoustic detection that would be measurable. Some sort of energy signature, yeah. It's, yeah. it's within range. It's only like the seventh arc is only like 14, 1600 kilometers away from those acoustic detectors, and they can hear sounds for up to 3,000 kilometers. So this conclusively rules out the seventh arc as being accurate. And there's more evidence, too, is the debris that washed up. Because people will say, well, what about this debris? That's like one of the most common things that I hear. Well, if you were around 10 years ago, and as like maybe adults that were following it like I was, it was really weird that the debris washed up in Africa. Everybody was going, wait, Africa? I thought you just told us it crashed off the coast of Australia. You can, anyone who's listening to this right now can just go look at an ocean current map and look at where the arc is, uh, the seventh arc, and you realize the debris should have washed to the east. The currents go to the east where the arc is. They don't go to the west. Mm. And so the debris should have washed up on the western coast of Australia. Instead, we have debris in South Africa or like mm. along the coast of the western, eastern coast of Africa. It, you just do the math in terms of how far that is away. It's literally impossible for that debris to have washed up there. And they play this like mental jujitsu where they like only talk about the media, I mean, only talks about this flapper on. And right, people don't right. realize that when they did a flapper on test, they falsified the fap flapper on test as well. The first thing that they did was they threw some boards in the ocean and there was a 0% chance they would make it to the reunion Island in time. And they went, Oh crap, this isn't good. So then they have the Americans give them a, a real Boeing triple seven flapper on, they throw that in the ocean and they realize like, Oh, the, it's sticking out of the water. Okay. Well, this is, this is fine. We can rationalize this because the wind will blow it and then it'll, it'll get it to the right spot. <laughs> right and it'll be able to get it there in time. And there's only a couple of problems with this is that there's barnacles on the area that would have been out of the water when they find it. So that would have had mm -hmm. to been submerged. And then they go test the barnacles and they realize the barnacles don't have nearly enough growth. They're not big enough to have been in the water long enough. They only have like four months of growth on them, which again, rules it out as, as the crash site being the place. And when you look at those, uh, there's a couple like papers, scientific papers that show the drift analysis. They all have the water, the currents going to the, the west, but you can just look at the map and see they don't go to the west, they go to the east. So it's like, huh. it, there's no chance that that debris, it, it is from MH370, I believe, it just didn't go in the water where they're claiming it did. Um, and if you rule out the satellite pings, uh, that's literally the only thing we've had to rule out for the story that I put forth, which is an incredible one. But that three orbs circle around this plane while the United States is filming it in the Nicobar Islands and, for lack of a better term, teleport it somewhere else. We even can say generally where it's been teleported because the right hand rule, the pointing vector in physics, in electrical mm -hmm. engineering, would say that if you take look at the front of the plane and watch the orbs spinning around it, that is your magnetic field. That's your curling field, my fingers right here. And then your electric field is going to be pointing downwards. So what that means is the vector of travel is going to be going backwards from the direction of the plane. And this is interesting because when you look at the final frame of the plane, when it blurs to when this wormhole opens up, it looks like it's pulled backwards a little bit. And if you, we, and like I said, in the beginning, we can actually map the vector of the coordinate shifts of the, of the satellite video, and we can tell the plane is going to the east. So if it's going backwards, that means it's going somewhere to the west. This plane's not going to another dimension. It's not going to the moon. It's not going to the Andromeda galaxy. It's somewhere else on Earth. And what's west of the Nicobar Islands? The Maldives are. Mm -hmm. And then it turns out, surprise, surprise, a B777 fire suppression device washes up in the Maldives. It gets reported on, literally gets reported on as a bomb when it's not. It's a B777 fire suppression device. And 20 islanders on a small island literally see the plane in the early morning hours where they can see the red and white stripes of Malaysian Airlines. These people don't see jumbo jets. They're on an island of 3,000 people. And they see it flying towards Diego Garcia military base, one of the most advanced secretive military bases in the United States. So to me, I'm just looking at this evidence. I'm going, well, that's where it went. Like, I, I mean, that's just, you know, it seems incredible, but that's what we got on video. That's what the witnesses would show. And uh, once you figure out that those satellite pings were either falsified, you know, fabricated or misinterpreted, then that's the logical answer. It was you know, a, a f emergency event that then led to this um, orbiting event, if you want to call it. Yeah. Let, let me ask you this. I mean, I guess if Diego Garcia has these huge aircraft carriers and they've got all of these, um, you know, infrastructure to have however many staff they have, I mean, 
is it realistic to think that the orbs are like stored there, built there, um, underwater? Yeah, so it's so for those of us who've been drinking water from a fire hose to try to figure what's been going on yeah. the last couple of weeks, yeah. I guess tease out what the the orbs you think are. You know, Eli five, please, to the layman in the room. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so there's something called exotic vacuum objects, EVOs. Okay. Um, it's some kind of small device inside of a plasma field. So plasma okay. physics and and semiconductors are the two pieces of science that you need to understand to understand these orbs. This is not a metal ball, although maybe inside is a metal ball. We can't really tell. But one of the earliest things I saw when when you look at the thermal video, the reason why the thermal video, which is the drone video, the one that's blue and, and, and colored, that one is, they were definitely filming that for intelligence purposes. Like, I don't think this is the first time they've used these orbs, but they probably don't use them very often. So whenever they use them, they want to, like, have the best intelligence possible so they can give it back to the engineers and stuff and say, like, you know, this is how it worked, this is how it played, make it better. And you can see this heat signature in the orb, and you can tell right away that it's a field around something smaller uh, just because of, like, the, the way the color gradient works on it. Um, and that's when I realized right away it was some kind of plasma field. And then the more I dug into it, I realized there's this whole area of plasma physics, low-energy nuclear reactions, plasmoids uh, that, are, that people have been looking into, which is like essentially low-energy nuclear reactions are the same idea as cold fusion. So it's like, you know, the sun, when you look at the sun, which is a ball plasma. Um, and it's a very, the same idea. And then we see this heat signature in there. It looks like a Tesla sign as well. And this is the idea that it is um, uh, cohering energy from the environment, that there's like a magnetic monopole, like one half of a magnet that is able to somehow produce this field around them from some smaller device on the inside, and that this can create a gravitational effect. And when we look at the orb as well, we can see that there's these black lines in front of it, these cold lines in front of it. Yeah, yeah, this the trail, is, like it's riding on rails. The trail, yeah. And that's probably the weirdest detail in the videos because there's nothing like that anywhere, not even in the UFO videos, nothing like that I've, anyone's ever seen. Yeah, usually don't so, they have tails rather than preceding anything? Right? Yes, exactly. In time of point. And when you look at Alcoberry Warp Drive, this is a very similar concept. Alcoberry Warp Drive is like contracting and expanding space around you. Okay. That's what these orbs are doing. It's like they're on a conveyor belt. Or like what I would say is like if you had like a rug below you and you pull the rug, it's not that the orbs themselves are propelling themselves. They're literally just bending, pulling space around them. This is why okay. they can perform the maneuvers they're doing. This is why they can achieve. We, we mapped the orb intercepting the plane at roughly 3,000 miles an hour, 2,000 to 3,000 miles an hour. So this is like, you know, Mach 2, yeah. Mach 3, something like really, really fast speeds. Um, and then they are immediately like match the speed of the plane. Um, and so, yeah, that detail with the pulling space in front of them, like that's our first gravity manipulation that we're seeing here. Um, and this goes well beyond what anyone in the UFO community really had even imagined, I think. Everybody just thinks it's like, you know, some – you saucer that's like floating freely they can only like, conceive you know. propellant right they don't understand yeah. how you know other forms of movement right right you know there was exactly. and some of them do talk about it go ahead th there was one gentleman who i don't i'm gonna mess up his name i, I, I want to call him commander david fravor but he was the younger guy i think grush yep. was a little bit older guy and he's the one that kind of said that he had this orb with a box inside of it do you do you know oh, who? uh ryan graves probably graves, that's who it is and I yes think ryan graves was talking about i think he's seen stuff himself but a lot of yeah. people have spoken to him and yeah, it was like the sphere with a, with a box inside. Right. And that would be crazy if that's what we were looking at here. But I, I don't know. I've never talked to him personally. I did. I think I sent him a message one time, like many, many, many months ago. But none of the UFO people would even talk to me for the most part, which I thought was very odd, mm. because I'm like, here's here's everything you want on a silver platter, sir. Yeah, like right. you know, like <laughs> what what more do you want? We're looking at gravity manipulation. I've got a real wormhole here. I've got some floaty orbs going on. You know, like this is everything you want. And yeah, I, I've yeah. kind of realized a few things related to that is that, yes, I think that absolutely this is what we're seeing out there uh, a lot of the times when people are seeing UFOs and that a vast majority of it is us. It's, it's you know, United States, China, Russia. When they say stuff about drones, like, I think this is what they're talking about. Like, why do you guys think they don't show us whatever these drones look like? Is because right. they're not little DJI drones. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, you know, so. Um, and I think that the problem with a lot of the people who are like whistleblowers, specifically, I would say Lou Elizondo and David Grush, is that they have NDAs. And what I've learned about this is there's special access programs where you can't even answer questions that would reveal the special access program. 
uh, if you have an NDA. And the nice thing is that I don't have an NDA. I, I do have a security clearance, but it's in healthcare uh, due to my okay. contracting job. So I have no NDA that would, I mean, I have no nothing related to any of this technology. It's just me, all this is just public knowledge. Right. Um, and that's the thing is that they can't speak about it. And this is why they get, they get into this box where they can't, like it's easy to discredit them where they can't say anything, otherwise they'll go to jail. And if they, because they're not saying anything, people will just discredit them and say, oh, there's just trust me, bro, situation. No, yeah. Nothing burgers, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, and you, then the real problem is this, is that you realize that this technology is not as simple as just floaty orbs and even teleporting planes, which is pretty scary to look at, but it's also a weapon. This is a, this is an arms race between China, Russia, and us to figure out how this technology works. Whoever has advanced it the most is going to control the whole planet. And this is where... You know, David Grush, Lou Elizondo, these people like, you know, they're patriots. It's Memorial Day. I'm wearing my red, white and blue today. <laughs> uh, nice, nice. But that, you know, they, you know, they don't want to give away the secrets to our enemies. And this is what Salvatore Paez would tell me on, on both interviews I did with him. He had like a 10 minute disclaimer on one of them about I want to be careful about what I say because I don't want to give away any secrets to our adversaries. And that, that's a moral dilemma. So I think that's yeah. the reason why this stuff has been kept hidden. It's not about aliens and, you know telepathically communicating with them or whatever and crash retrievals. This is about like an arms race. So is that why this has kind of come up now, right? We're 10 years in, what have we been yeah. doing for 10 years? And I guess it's the, the, the release of the AARO committee in Congress. And I know that you've actually spoken with them in the past as well. Can you tell us a little bit about what your communication's been and, and where it's been? And before you do though, I want to comment, like yeah. what you were just saying about Grush, I watched him sit in front of I think it was the AARO, and they were asking him, have you seen the non-human intelligence? And have you been in the room? And do you know what departments are involved in it? And he says, yes, I know. Well, can you tell us? No, I can't. Let's go in the skiff. Presumably they went that in the skiff. Congress, yeah. And and he told them, so like, isn't that the end of the alien discussion? I, I, I know we're not aliens here, but like, right? What are we talking about? It's done. So what is your communication with the AARO been? Yeah, good question. Um, and yeah, I think the alien stuff is a big distraction personally too, where it's like mm. the government wants us talking about aliens and alien bodies because we're not talking about the advanced right, right. super weapon technology that's that they're hiding and that like literally potentially free energy that could just change our whole planet. Like we don't have to have pollution. We can be energy independent, all this stuff. Like that's what this leads to. But so I think that they love that we're just sitting here talking about aliens and that these congressional hearings like the one you were just talking about that, you know, they're not digging into like, OK, tell us about the special access programs from Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman and Bigelow Aerospace and Boeing Phantom Works and all these other <laughs> things. Right. Where you've got these engineers where that's the last thing they want us talking about. Yeah. Um, the AARO is mostly, I think, a disinformation uh, apparatus. Uh, it's a gatekeeping apparatus. And they love also when they have whistleblowers that come to them that have these stories about, you know, telepathically communicating with aliens because there's no substance to that. You know, like they can easily dismiss that and not address it. The This stuff that I gave them is much more difficult to dismiss because I'm like, hey, here's two videos that are leaked on the Internet. You can confirm that that's an MQ-1C Great Eagle or some other variant of an MQ-1 drone, uh, that that's exactly what the cameras look like. You can confirm that this is satellite footage that nobody in the world knew even looked like at the time and we were able to deduce that it's like literally google earth with this like quick terrain modeler or equivalent uh software that they use to render an environment to like actually like someone can log yeah. into a computer system can you actually speak to that like, a little okay, bit start up new project because because yeah. that was one of the so, things that they brought up right how mm -hmm. this was some sort of um you, you there was 2d still clouds and there was lighting effects on it but I, according to what you've kind of said it's not even really a photograph or a video it's something totally yeah. different. yeah so where to start off with that let's just start with what, what i was able to do so then i can talk a little bit about the debunk stuff so early okay. on we had found usa 229 which is a naval ocean surveillance satellite pair that was right over the in the malacca straits like staring right down at those coordinates at 1840 utc which proves the United States government knows what happened to this plane regardless. And we had two people uh, peer review it. Uh, one person was actually a debunker from the Metabunk forums, uh, Harold, I think their name was. And the other one was Victor Illinello of the independent group. And he actually did his math wrong initially and tried to say that the, the, our trajectories were incorrect. And then we corrected him and then he deleted his post and, and said, yep, you're right, actually the satellite was right there in the right exact spot. But then he went, no, no, well, it can't be satellite because 
you know, the satellite would be moving too fast. And I went, well, how do you guys think satellites work? I mean, it's not like we have them up there doing nothing. So we were able to deduce that uh, and actually just found supporting evidence that it actually, the Cibber system, space-based infrared and sentient, which is the AI that is declassified that manages the satellites, it actually pulls data from satellites all the time in a constellation. And they have real-time uh, global persistent infrared surveillance which means like these satellites are scanning the whole world all the time. And they're sending all that data to ground-based computers, some of these database farms. I think there was a giant one we built in Utah. And then uh, I found some, I don't think I've posted this on, on the internet yet, but we found another corroborating thing that says that like basically they can log into this database. They can start a project for like an operation or whatever they want. You know, Ashton's project stealing MH370. And then you pick your location and then now you've got rendering video of your situation, of your, of tracking whatever you want to track, potentially over a giant field of view, might even be thousands of kilometers wide. We don't know exactly how wide, but we are able to deduce this because we can see the mouse come off the top right of the screen onto the screen like this. And it goes off to the bottom left, which tells okay. us that we're looking at this cropped field of view here. And the way the person's tracking it doesn't mean that the coordinates are right on the plane. The co those coordinates could be like 500 miles away or 200 miles away. We don't know. They're just moving the screen from this like center of axis mm. to keep the plane in the focus of the cropped field of view. In fact, we can tell that the start stop record button is somewhere up here in the top right because right. Uh, you can watch the mouse come in from that location and it's like perfectly timed with them like pressing start record. And then the mouse coming in at the end, they scroll back up to the top and they press stop recording as well, which was another detail that we learned. Um, so this was helped us to understand like why it doesn't appear that the satellite is moving. And we know that too, because the coordinates only change when the perspective changes. It yeah. doesn't, it's otherwise if the satellite was moving nonstop, you'd expect those coordinates to be moving in real time as opposed to only when they move the perspective around. And the coordinate shifts are accurate to real coordinate shifts. It's not a situation where somebody just put random numbers in the bottom left. Like those are right. real coordinate shifts that they would have to overlay over their fake video. Um, and then with respect to the clouds moving, that was just a falsehood. So I think you're referring to the corridor crew brought this idea of the clouds not moving. And, and usually people say, why aren't the clouds moving? This is honestly one of the dumbest questions I've ever heard. I don't know how to be nicer about it because you can just look outside <laughs> and the clouds don't look like they're moving. And this is only like a couple miles away. <laughs> sure. uh, the satellites right, would right. be t sending data from 900 kilometers away. And to prove this, the corridor crew took a video from the moving space station <laughs> and, oh, right. and they tried to claim that the, the, the yeah, they're like, oh, well, this should be moving. And, and again, I've already explained how it's ground based computer systems. Uh, but I took a video actually that shows uh, like a, a video footage from space looking at the earth and the clouds and the earth and, and they all look completely static. I mean, that's what you would expect. In addition to the fact that each of these perspectives we see is like five seconds long, mm -hmm. but people actually went and proved that the clouds are moving, like beyond any shadow of a doubt, several of them. And the way they did it was simply you take the first frame from one of these perspectives that's five seconds long and compare it to the last frame and you just speed it up or you just flip back and forth. And you not only can you see the clouds moving, they're actually evolving like they evolve naturally as if there's like wind shear on the top of the clouds. And so we've got several videos that uh, prove that. I can even share one real quick if you guys want, sure. yeah, um, yeah. just so that people can kind of see for themselves. Uh, because I think this is one of the big points of contention that people really uh, struggle with on, on the videos and, and to realize how real that they are. Um, and this also, in my mind at least, this, this rules out uh, so you can see, if you can see my mouse, like right around here, you're going to be able to see this cloud mo moving pretty, pretty clearly there. You can see it evolving up and down. And you guys should see like all the clouds evolving. You can see the evolution up here as well. So this is the same video and you can see the clouds evolving pretty naturally right there. And there's um, several other locations where you can see that same thing. That's just one example that we've been able to show. Um, so beyond any doubt, those clouds are moving, which I would argue rules out any type of 2D cloud background, um, because one of the major debunks that's been out there is this cloud image that appeared on the internet. Yep, right, um, right. All the debunks appear to come from like just days old Reddit accounts. Um, and even without going into the veracity of where and, and the background of where the cloud image came from, which is extremely suspect, um, we can just rule out a 2D cloud image anyway, because we've got two different videos from two different angles of the same exact event that are in perfect synchronization with one another. There's no discrepancies on a single frame. Like this would require a 3D rendered environment to produce. You're not going to be able to do this with just 
uh, 2D render environment and then match it up to another 2D render environment. If you're producing this as a VFX artist, any honest VFX artist would say, well, you've got two videos, you're gonna make a 3D render environment, you're gonna take two shots to get it to line up. We've got moving evolving clouds which show three dimensional capabilities. Uh, the biggest thing as well is this picture uh, that I'm gonna pull up right here in a second, which is a uh, the flash in the satellite video shows accurate three, uh, 3D lighting, which is probably one of the most difficult things, especially using software in 2014 to get accurate. Um, I'm trying to find it right now. Yeah, I know what you're talking While about, the I'm front lighting and the back lighting of the clouds. Yeah, yeah exactly, the, different the front lighting, lighting elements, and the back yeah. lighting. Yeah. And while I'm pulling that up, I'll show you this other one here, uh, which is we the clouds actually match in both videos too. So we have like hmm. three or four points of like proof that these videos will require a full 3D rendered environment. And the debunkers out there don't want to admit this because it increases the complexity multiple like magnitudes more complex than trying to produce this like with uh, two or 2.5 dimensional uh, software such as like After Effects. So here I'll show that this first cloud right here you see in the background on the bottom yeah. okay. is potentially the one you see down here in the bottom right. And so you can imagine drawing a line here from the plane, from the drone all the way over to the bottom right. And then the second cloud right here, you can see the second cloud is clearly this one right behind it, right here. So you can actually almost triangulate the exact position of the drone just off the field of view here. So this is this, this big cloud right here. And then again, if I just back it up for a second, you can see this second cloud way back here, which is presumably this one. Now keep in mind when we're looking at this satellite video, it's at an angle. So it's right, hard right. to get a perception of exactly yeah. where the plane really is. Um, but, and exactly how far away some of these clouds are from the plane. Uh, but this, to me, like, there's no way you're doing this with two, two dimensional um, graphic uh, representations. This, this, to me, proves you, you would need to have a 3D rendered environment to pull this off. So we're definitely seeing clouds on the satellite IR video, and then we're also seeing clouds in the thermal video. What we're also seeing in both of those videos is what you say is not contrails. Um, and that's due to the altitude of the airplane, and that's due to the cumulonimbus clouds, if I have it right. Now, what, what Nico said was that the trails turned green, showing a heat signature. And when I heard him say that, I lit up. I go, that makes sense compared to the other part of this story we haven't touched on yet, right? Which was maybe there was a fire in the belly of the beast. Yeah. So let me show real quick. I've got the, 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 uh, cl or, um, the lighting picture here as well that I can show. Okay. So right here as well, you can see the lighting. So this is extremely difficult. And I have a, um, there's a, a, a graph that are, um, let's see, like a color contrast changed animated version of just the zap that I'll be posting on the internet in the next couple of days as well. Yeah, we'll import it here. Shows, yeah, which clearly shows how difficult this is. But you can see here the front lighting, the back lighting of these clouds. This cloud down here has no lighting on it because it's occluded from the other clouds. This one has slight amounts of backlight, and this one also has slight amount of backlight. So that, to me, shows that you know all of those pieces of evidence show that this would require a 3D rendered environment. And like I was saying, this is something that's like the hardest thing for you know people to admit from the debunker side because it makes it very complicated. And we already have a very narrow window of opportunity to produce these videos. And using software and hardware from 2014 uh, would require potentially weeks just to render a 3D environment. Uh, and they know that, which is why they're being kind of dishonest about it and trying to ignore this evidence. Um, with respect to what Nico said, like um, on the corridor crew stuff, uh, or actually before we get to that, I just want to finish up my conversation, my yes, thought about the AARO stuff. Yeah, please. So I've given this information to the AARO. Uh, I talked to somebody in January and uh, I, I, they, the only thing they asked me is not to say their name. They didn't say, I could, they said I could talk about anything else related to it. I don't have to sign an NDA or anything like that. Uh, they didn't mind that I wasn't a first-hand whistleblower. Uh, they wanted mostly first-hand whistleblower people, but I gave them verifiable evidence. So I guess that was fine. Um, he seemed, uh, I, I've said that it was a man, that's fine. He, I, he seemed very confident that we're not like hiding technology the way he would speak to me about it. And I was just kind of sitting there with a smile on my face, like, well, wait until you dig into what I've got for you. Yeah. And this guy um, I also, yeah. <laughs> And because I think that I might have red pilled this guy, like to the point where like he really didn't think we had stuff. And then when he looks <laughs> in these videos, he's gonna be like, oh, crap. Oh, um, boy. I gave him Edward C. Lynn. So I was actually able to identify the potential leaker of these videos. I won't go into all of it. But what I'll say is like 
I FOIA'd the NCIS into this guy's case, and they rejected it for the interest of national defense and foreign policy. This guy checks every single box. He's got signals intelligence all over his, his record. You know, right position, right time. You know, he was part of this spy plane program that started, or his assignment started February 2014, right before the plane disappeared. His lawyer says the investigation began April 2nd, 2014. You know, we can tell that somebody's doing a screen recording uh, on a Citrix session logged into a remote terminal into the Spy Sally database, so they're going to get caught. Um, so everything about this guy says he's a guy, in addition to the fact that his lawyer said that the classified information question is available on the Internet. And recently, we've been looking at other whistleblower accounts, and they say some of this stuff is so secretive that they don't even classify it because just to go through the classification process would reveal <laughs> it to more people. It's a strike uh, effect So this makes you wonder, yeah. like, yeah, exactly. So this makes you realize, like, oh, wow, like, this stuff might not even have had, like, the highest levels of secrecy because it's that it's – or the highest levels of classification because it's that secret that's out there. He also had above top secret access, access to the Navy's black budget program. So this guy fits, checks every single box in a way that, like, I would never have imagined I could find somebody like this. Mm -hmm. So I've already set the bar and said, here's, I told Arrow, go find out what he, what he leaked on the Internet that the government was literally so afraid of that they wanted him to take a plea deal because they thought if he went to the court that they would have to show the evidence. They were terrified of it. Mm. So they end up forcing him into a plea deal, and they had to admit that there was no evidence that he was a spy. Like, even though they decided they tried to get him on this espionage charge for life, and they're like, well, just kidding. We have no actual evidence he's a spy. And everyone's like, wait, what? What do you mean? You're trying oh. to get a guy for espionage, but you had no evidence? But it was a plea deal. That's like, why what? they got him. So then they get him on the plea deal for just – dissemination of classified information and secrets to they try to like honeypot him uh with an fbi agent and they still give him nine years if you guys go look at this these types of charges people that get convicted of these types of charges nine years is grossly disproportionate like the expected amount of time someone would have got would have been like a year or two well he gets nine years presumably he's leaking this stuff that people disappear over i mean i would actually right, push right. back on you Ashton. i'd say nine years is quite insignificant i mean it happened in 2014 right if He's the like, videos Out. are what he leaked yes right? yeah yeah but, and that's the thing is if you look at it from the perspective of what if these videos are what he leaked then you go well nine years makes a lot more sense in fact you could argue maybe it should have been more but the reason why is that there was also mitigating circumstances he got three years shaved off and only ended up serving six because he worked with the ncis and the fbi and he ended up you know, making this statement that he was very sorry and he should serve as an example to other people that would try to do something like this in the future. He might have made an honest mistake, too. Like, I personally believe that he might have shown somebody these videos and didn't expect them to get on the Internet. And then mm. that person got them onto the Internet. And now Edward C. Lynn is screwed over. Right. Because you just he, let's say, for example, he had Taiwanese counterparts. He potentially was a spy himself, like for us. Uh, oh, he had a pre-existing relationship with the NCS and FBI, and everyone's like, why would he have a pre-existing relationship with them? So there might have been mitigating circumstances for why he only got nine years. But you can imagine from the government's perspective, you leak these videos, and you're like, this guy had to be a spy. He's showing China what we just did to the, this plane. And um, so I gave that information to the AARO, and it said, go, go, go figure it out. And so the last communication I got them from them on April 11th, which is almost a month and a half ago, said that they found something related to the United States' search efforts after the plane went missing from radar, which the public available story is the plane went missing from radar 1822 UTC. They changed it from 1840 UTC, which is what they were saying the day the plane disappeared. And 1840 UTC is the time in our videos in the Nicobar Islands where the plane was actually <laughs> there. And I'm wondering, okay, well, what did they find after 1822 UTC that the, the United States was searching? I mean, I'm that's pretty much the exact time I'm pinpointing these videos going down. Um, and then that was the last communication. They said that they wanted to talk to me again and that they wanted to know the genesis of the videos. And I'm like, guys, if these videos aren't real, that's not how you respond to somebody where you didn't find anything. Like you would come back and be like, well, that was a CGI video. That's not what the drones look like. And we don't have any spy surveillance uh, satellite video capabilities like you just showed us, you know? Uh, so that's a really weird response. And I, I truly believe, I don't have proof, but I believe that like, the Pent they're underneath the Pentagon and the DOD that they came down and were like, hey, stop talking to this guy. Like, don't give him any more information. Stop telling him stuff. Like, because there's nothing they can say to me at this point. Like, they can't even gaslight me. I just have so much evidence at this point. Um, and anything that they were to tell me is just going to leak out more. The same reason why they can't give me, the NCIS can't give me anything about Edward C. Lynn's case. 
because if they like fail to redact even one wrong thing and we can piece it together, you know, there you've got absolute proof. Yeah. Um, I, I guess when so I, it's when it's when cool when I God. when I hear your story, Ashton, I'm sorry. I, I like what you're saying, and I agree with actually most of it because you're right. You've painted this kind of picture that kind of makes sense, and that's what I feel that these debunkers are kind of falling short on doing. Is they're not exactly able to paint a picture. What what would a motivation of a hoaxer yes. be besides sowing chaos? I I guess, but we've confirmed it's like a very high level VFX artist and also a very high level military guy, like. It just doesn't necessarily add up to me, but but here I think that Edward C. Lynn thing is very interesting, and I you know Googled his name a few times, and of course the, the military or the Navy I think has put out a couple statements on him. Uh, they actually found like a one-page cut sheet. I didn't know they'd make like uh, yeah. brochures for arrests and trials. But the only <laughs> thing I could think is like when I compare this is it was semi recently was Chelsea Manning, and she leaked these documents and these videos. Actually, it was FLIR videos. She leaked three of them. But but at the same time, there were like a quarter million, if not, I think it was over 300,000 different documents and cables. And it was from, well, I, I have the number here. It was 271 different embassies around the world. So she was able to go in, get to every piece of data that they wanted, leak O almost a half a million pieces of communication and documents, and she was given 30 years, but that was, you know, almost at pride, right? It's against the Obama administration, the Clintons, like, is does that level 30 years for just embarrassing the hubris of a Democratic president versus releasing this potentially world-changing, earth-shattering, yeah, yeah. right? We're racing the Russians and the Chinese to get nine years. I don't want to put words in your mouth. Maybe it's like this Streisand effect we were talking about. Well, how do you level that? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that when you look at how people get sentenced, the number of charges is huge. Mm. So with respect right. to like leaking 3,000 things, you're getting like 3,000 charges of that. That's the reason why you're getting 30 years. It's not because of necessarily just embarrassing them. And that's just the way the law works. The law it doesn't make a lot of sense sometimes. Um, this is also the reason why I think like, uh, was it Aaron Schatz who started Reddit or whatever was going to get like 25 years. Some of our like hacking and, uh, laws and stuff like that were archaic because of these same reasons, because it would be like, how many charges do you get? And how do you quantify, you know, I pulled a repository that has a hundred documents in it. Same stuff with like even WikiLeaks and things like that, where it's like, you know, it's, it's just, it's not proportionate. Uh, versus like the situation where you have two charges of dissemination of classified information. You can't give somebody uh, that much time. It's already crazy to give them nine years see, uh, for right. those types of charges. So you have to put that into some perspective like that. It's, it's not a situation where it's a matter of how damaging the information was. You have to go by the book in terms of what the book says those charges can, can give you. Um, but then you do have to put in some context. And I would say that, yeah, you know, even stuff like 30 years for documents that may not be that damaging uh, wouldn't be a lot. But what I would say, too, is that we should probably look at some of those documents because sometimes stuff seems like it's not that damaging. And then you kind of begin to put it in context and realize that it is. I, I would also say this shows how easy it is for some of these people to have access to stuff that is extremely sensitive. Look at the Jack DeHara case. Uh, I mean, he, this guy was on Discord throwing out like the, the United States, um, you know, disinformation apparatus, all the media was trying to tell the world that Ukraine's destroying Russia in, in the war. And it turns out he just shows like, nope, it, we're, you know, you, here's the total casualties. Ukraine's getting absolutely obliterated. Right. Uh, they have no chance whatsoever. And, and, know, and, and the and official U S government, black eye. the official U S government response was, Oh, that was doctored. That was doctored. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, and they always do that. They, Cause it's, it's, the United States government has the best disinformation uh, media censorship apparatus in the entire world. Yeah. Uh, and that should be apparent from the, the Putin Tucker Carlson interview where Tucker like asked him, why would you not take a propaganda victory over the Nord Stream pipeline? Like, you know, the United States government did it. And he's like, well, it's not cost effective in order for us to get into a propaganda <laughs> war with the United States. They have complete control over all Western media. We'll, we'll lose. Same reason why China and Russia didn't blow the whistle on MH370. If China and Russia come out and say United States zapped the airplane away with teleportation technology from some orbs, everyone's going to laugh at them. Sorry for the swearing. Yeah, they're, yeah. yeah they're going to go like this. And, and you know, all the United States media, CNN's going to go, ah, China's so silly. They think that we've got yeah. crazy orbs that can teleport planes, you know, like, so they, there's nothing they can do. There's nothing they can even say at that point. Uh, and so, uh, you know, but 
going back to the point, you know, it, you realize that there are people that have all this access. Jack Tejero was like 20 years old yeah. or something like this, and he's got all the access to all the Ukraine war stuff out there. Like, they had to change all the procedures after that because they realized it was like way too open for people to get access to. And the reason why Edward Snowden, for example, didn't find all this stuff when he went snooping around is because it wasn't in the government servers. All this stuff is in special access programs with third party companies that have air gapped networks. Like they, what happens is you go to these buildings and they've got their own network inside the building that's completely air gapped from the outside. And then you log into the computer there and then you can pull up the secret schematics, the secret, literally scientific papers in some cases that aren't available to the public. Um, and that seems like wild, but that's actually how it works. Uh, and that's the reason why it's so easy to keep uh, secret and I just posted a thing earlier today as well that shows that it, it, they literally do what they do in the movies where it's like they just have shell organizations that you know this this hand hands money off to this hand and then this hand hands the money off to the people who are making the orbs and they're not making like just the orbs they make the components like hey make me the semiconductor that can produce this and then you over here you're going to make me the thing that allows for the plasma physics stuff and then we'll send this to like Los Alamos or uh, Sandia Labs or whatever and they'll go put it together you know, and this is how you compartmentalize it so that very small number of people know. But this is also why when you interview people, you don't want to talk to the David Grushes of the world. You don't even, Commander Fravor, I love that guy, but what you know, he has a firsthand sighting. You want to talk to the aerospace engineers that work on the third party labs. When you watch those interviews, like Paul Size, who I reviewed the other day, you're like, holy crap, this dude's talking about quantum mechanics and teleportation and wormholes. Like, what does this guy know? You know, he's been working on these labs for 30 years. Half of them are in special access programs with black projects. And he knows he can't, he can say, he can't say much, but he can talk about science. Right. And right. you're like, man, this is, that's wild, right? So, so I think the, there was a different video. I'm blanking on his name, but you've been posting it the last couple of days. And it was a gentleman, it looked like it's from the 80s. And he's got these electronic gauges and meters and all of that. And he zooms in on one small, like, you know, it looks like an external hard drive. Of course, it's yep. from the 80s, but he says this is where the power is coming from. I, I watched that video. I'm like, I don't really know what I'm looking at. I'm not an electrical engineer. It's definitely a lot of gauges, power is something. It's lighting light bulbs. But, I mean, are you able to kind of point to different devices in there that we know? Obviously, that one device is the, the linchpin there. But w can you just tell us, like, what exactly are we looking at here? Yeah, Thomas Bearden. That's Thomas it. Bearden is a legend. Uh, I've been able to just deduce that from watching his content and the how he's talked about exactly how the science was suppressed from us, which really boils down to incorrectly reducing Maxwell, uh, James Clerk Maxwell is the, like the father of electrical engineering, incorrectly reducing his 16 equations down to just the, the four or the six, I believe it was, with uh, Oliver Heaviside. That's what screwed us all over. That's where we lost all the gravity manipulation capabilities. Uh, and, and so he, Thomas Bearden talks about this idea of scalar physics, which the public doesn't take seriously, but I guarantee you the military and the government takes it seriously and these private okay. contractors take it seriously, uh, which is brings back this idea of the ether, uh, which was a, a big thing. Something that was big in the early um, Not to be confused with the cryptocurrency that I'm a big fan of, but I can't endorse it. <laughs> oh, is there an ether one? Yeah, <laughs> that's different. Yeah, and this is not like the esoteric ether. This is okay. like the space-time ether, which is this okay. idea that... It's the fabric of our reality. So very similar to the idea of space-time other than space is not empty. And so this space-time ether is unlimited negative energy or really just unlimited energy if you want to think of it like that. And whenever we are extracting energy anywhere, anytime, even now at the lights, that's where all the energy is technically coming from. And like everything we would see even as like a battery is a conduit to tap into that energy. And when you look at the world like that and you realize, and this was one of the most controversial posts I made the other day, is that power does not flow through wires. Power, you know, th those are conductors of electricity and energy, but power actually flows through the fields that the wires generate. The wires generate electromagnetic fields, and then the power flows through the fields, uh, or a power field is created based on those. And it, this is a significant difference because it depends then on the, on the way you set up your circuit. So if you set up a very elongated circuit and I have like a battery down here and I have my light up here, the power is flowing directly to it, even though I can have this circuit that goes all the way around. And that seems counterintuitive because everyone thinks, well, the power is flowing through the wires, but it's actually not. The power is flowing through the fields directly to the bulb. And we know that because we can measure how long it takes for the light to turn on. And the light is turning on as if the power is going directly 
to the bulb. And this is a very counterintuitive thing. And I've got electric electricians and electrical engineers like arguing with me in the replies. And I'm going, sorry, it's literally been proven. Go look at the Vertasium videos, which is this huge YouTuber with like 16 million followers who goes into it. And he, he even did a follow up because he had all these people trying to debunk him. And he's like, no guys like here, we're going to like literally scale it down and prove it for you. Uh, that's exactly how it works. And once you realize that you realize like, whoa, well, how is the power flowing through space? Like how is it flowing through empty space like that? And that's how you bring back this idea of the ether, which is the medium of okay. our reality that's out there. And uh, this is what Thomas Bearden was promoting with respect to scalar physics is that the electromagnetic waves are longitudinal through the ether. Uh, a transverse wave would be a wave that's you know like this, uh, and that's how we imagine electromagnetic waves flowing. Uh, a, a longitudinal wave would be like a sound wave, where like you don't you can't measure the sound wave like that. It's a longitudinal uh, vibration through the air. So sound requires air in order for us to make sounds. That's why if you go in outer space and you try to make a sound, right, it doesn't right. go anywhere. Hmm. Water waves require liquid in order for a water wave to perpetuate. Well, what kind of medium do we need for an electromagnetic wave? Hmm, maybe an ether, right? So this is the, just brings back the idea. It's, very, it's not that we have to throw out all physics. It's just that we have to reimagine space-time. Space-time is just not empty. It's a fabric. Just, and what is the paint? Mass. Mass is the paint. So this kind of begins to unify the idea of what some of Tesla's beliefs were okay. with Einstein's beliefs. And I think that both have valid arguments you know i think that we have to have curvature because the moment i bring up this stuff like all the flat earthers are on me like sure. no this proves that the earth is flat because <laughs> tesla didn't believe in in curvature and hated einstein and i'm like guys 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 like they're both a little bit correct it's not we don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater here gotcha gotcha um so what this means though is that free energy is possible because if we are just extracting energy from the environment all the time it's just a matter of configuring our system in such a way where uh, my buddy Dave Rossi, who's the, one of the DOD contractors I was talking about, says, like, you open up Pac-Man's mouth. So the second law of thermodynamics would say that you can't create a perfectly efficient system um, and that you can't get more energy out of your system than you put into it, which in a closed system, that's true. But if you open your system up and now you can extract energy from the unlimited source, which is the ether, which is on, like a sea of ocean of energy that is practically unlimited, as big as the universe is, now you can put in a little bit of energy and you can get out a lot more if you can amplify it correctly you can get out almost infinitely more and then you can make it like a little connection where you now take the stuff that you're getting out and you feed it back into your system and now you can create a device where you plug it in to start it up it starts producing more energy than it's getting getting put in you unplug it and it just produces energy forever that's an over unity device that's free energy free energy and this is what thomas bearden is showing in that video so what he's saying when you look at those meters he's saying you're getting 500 watts of energy out and he's got five light bulbs and a fan running and he goes and looks at the input and it's one third of a milliamp uh so it's like basically zero energy getting technically put into this thing so they've they've developed the system and this was in like the 80s or something the 70s i don't know exactly the date on that uh no it was like 89 i think or 87 uh so yeah in the 80s it's a significant kind of amount of time out. i mean for 40 years presumably the guy i mean i don't know if he's still alive right but his son or his partners are presumably still working on this. I guess the government is probably special access program developing more of this technology. Actually, something you might want to look into. I'm the I'm a Trump guy, Ashton. One of his last um, executive orders before leaving office was creating small portable nuclear reactors. Are you aware of that? Uh, I did not know that, but it doesn't surprise me very much. Yeah, no. and it was designed to, to uh, it was designated specifically for mobile bases and also space usages. So now they presumably have these reactors the size of an 18-wheeler that can power an entire military base, which is pretty interesting. Yeah, so let me say here, too, that I've got it on extremely good authority that these devices have already been getting made. Yeah. Uh, the military is using them, maybe like, let's say, submarines that need to be very quiet. Okay. They can't have a giant reactor might be using some of these types of devices to power the entire submarine or uh, some rich people that are in the private sector uh, have these because Get they know special the, access, the engineers access. that can make them. Yeah. It's a matter of who you know in this world, right? right so right. if you know these engineers that are these private contractor engineers and they know this technology exists and is possible, uh, and if you watch the Thomas Bearden video, that, and that's who we were talking about right there, I've reviewed like all of his videos at this point. One of them, he talks about his own free energy device called the Meg. Uh, motionless electromagnetic generator, Gener something like that. Say, gee. Um, yeah, and in his, he explains that like the secret, because everyone asks, well, why isn't it out there? 
Well, it takes very highly specialized skill in order to get the magnetic resonance correct and tune it correctly because you have to get the fields exactly set up the right way in order for it to be efficient enough to get the over unity out of it. You can make it in a way where it's not very efficient, but what you need to get is you need to get coefficient of performance greater than one, which is more energy out than you're put in. Right, right. And you need to get that to a high enough point, like two or three, where now like you're just you really scale energy off juice of it, out right. of this thing, right? Yeah. And this is where it's like a situation where a lot of people ask me, you know, why not just why not just put it on the blockchain, like the way to do it? Well, because the same way, like you don't put the blockchain of like how to make a phone, you know, on you don't put this on the blockchain either, like. It's all proprietary. The people that can do it are, you know, far, few and far between. And that's what Thomas Bearden says as well, is that and many of them are well compensated. They're already, you know, employed and they don't have any interest in potentially being disappeared or what have you. So what I've been doing, um, which I feel comfortable saying, I guess, is, is talking to some of these people who theoretically could make these types of devices and figuring out, like, how do we commercialize this? And people are going to get mad at me and go, well, why are you trying to commercialize free energy? And well, I would say because that's how the free market works. That's what that's how economy works. Free energy doesn't mean that everybody gets a free energy device for free. That's not what free energy means. <laughs> right, like, right, right. There's still a cost Just to produce the labor it. Capital there's a labor cost. It. Damn yeah. socialists. Yeah, we got to build a good machine. <laughs> In fact, it's, it's probably very expensive to begin with. Yeah, sure. Just like, like I would compare it to like Tesla cars. Like electric cars have been possible for much longer than Tesla has been around. And the Tesla company, initially, everybody thought it was going to fail as well. I mean, people, I don't know if you guys remember, but like probably early 2010s, maybe even early 2000s, or late sure. 2000s, people were betting to get in, short selling it. Everyone said it was going to fail, blah, blah, blah. Never could make money. Now look at it, it's worth a ton of money at this point. I think several hundred billion dollars, if I had to right. guess. I, I haven't seen their market cap recently. Uh, but the thing is, it's not about having the idea existing. It's about figuring out a way to commercialize it. And then the question really is, how do you bring it to the masses? You know, How do you bring it so that every Joe Schmo can have one of these devices? Because the reality is, it's, it's going to be expensive. It's not going to be a situation where it's like, $50, here's your free energy device. You know, The materials required... The specialized skill to set it up, at least in the short term, is, is very, going to be pretty expensive. I imagine, and I, this don't quote me on this or anything, that it would be similar to like the cost of an automobile, you know, where and it can scale up. You know, if you want the deluxe model and a super, you know, V12 engine versus like just something small. But there's still benefits to that, where you could, you know, you could have like like an apartment building could have one that powers like every apartment in there right and now you can kind of take that cost and scale it down kind of like with like wi-fi where like i don't know if like when wi-fi first came out it was like oh we have one wi-fi router <laughs> and everybody shares it yeah, you know yeah. like it could be something like that so uh i think free energy is coming for sure i want to be one of the first people that uh does try to commercialize it and I know this is about MH370, but it's funny that that's how this all leads back to free energy that's what why i was just gonna say you, why are you covering yeah, up yeah, these yeah. videos you know is that as I started to dig through the science and I found out that Thomas Bearden was explaining the literal videos in this cold explosion, and I'm like, wait, cold explosion? That's what we're seeing in the thermal video. It's a cold endothermic event. And he's talking about extracting energy in one location and sending it somewhere else and using uh, essentially macroscopic phase conjugation, which is this idea that we're seeing in those videos where we're like slingshotting this plane. Uh, and then the, what the orbs are doing is they're creating a zero point system. Like the reason why it's equilateral triangle is not accidental. A zero point system is like a line going like this, or it can be like this. And so then when they all point their, you know, scalar beams, wave beams, they're creating this gravitational wave, this gravitational effect around the plane. They're creating a, a wormhole. Um, and once I saw him explain that, I'm like, okay, what else is this guy saying? Like, let me, like, you know, I need to understand the concepts of how this is possible. And you realize right away that there's an ether of unlimited negative energy. And that's what leads you to free energy. And then I'm sitting here going, well, I was just watching the Fallout TV show. And, you know, the whole spoiler alert, everybody. That's okay. Spoiler alert. We're good. We're on it. And the, the Fallout TV show, you know, the end is like, well, it's all about free energy. And you realize that massive implications. People will kill each other over free energy. You know, free energy just changes everything. And then I'm like, okay, yeah, this is why they're hiding this video. Like, yes, I'm sure gravitational technology is great what have you people are going to be asking questions where this came from and yeah all, all those I, I utility know. companies can't send you bills anymore they're going to be pretty upset right yeah and well, that's why jp morgan shut tesla down because he couldn't put a meter on it you <laughs> right, know, i don't right. know if people realize j the real jp morgan really told the real tesla to like basically stopped investing in him because he couldn't put a meter on free energy and you're like damn like this is what this all leads to like right, this right. is huge yeah. and that's where it's like okay well you know what i just keep pushing the government further and further on these videos where i'm like 
we keep finding more and more evidence about them, confirming that they're potentially real. Uh, and it's like, okay, I'm not going to stop pushing. So, okay, what's the next step? Okay, well, now what if I just prove that free energy is real? What if I go into business, start selling devices of like literal extracting energy from the ether and just start proving it to people that it's real? Hey. Are people still going to think the videos are fake? Did I just glean this from the, no, right. from the ether? From the I, ether, I don't know. yeah, maybe. <laughs> I, I, I will say, Ash, and that is a leap. I, I mean, I hope that you are the harbinger of free power. That would be great. Um, but that would be wild. And right, from going early, from diagnosing yeah. videos to then free power, I will say I <laughs> you might have gone over my head, but I can see how it That would is. definitely make a great movie in the future i'll say that much i'll just Give say me, when uh, you release it i hope you remember us way back in the day and you cut us a special deal on those devices that's all i'm sure. saying <laughs> yeah we'll definitely see on that so yeah i don't know what the future holds at all um and when i have more to announce on that front uh i think it'll be kind of exciting I, I do think i'm in a good spot now though where it's like i've built up this huge following of people that i would never have expected where it's like well maybe this is the moment where this gets out to the public like this is maybe what it takes to get this type of disclosure at least with respect to free energy and then maybe retroactively we can get the truth about the videos i think that if those videos are real i'm interested in zero videos i don't know how the government admits it like there's so much legal liability at stake in addition to national security uh because of the implications i mean even the implications of free energy are dangerous you know you give people a free energy device you know, it's like giving people plutonium, you know, like now you're like, OK, did I just give somebody the ability to make a weapon of mass destruction? Um, so that it does get a bit scary on that front. But it's the kind of stuff where it's a discovery. So you, you can't hold it back forever. At some point, it's going to get out there. It's just a matter of when and when is it going to be safe and how are we going to manage it? So. Um, that's my thought on that. But I did want to talk a little bit about some of the debunk stuff and, and the corridor crew thing. Yeah, and absolutely. Dana Jones, if you guys want to chat about that. Yeah, yeah please for do. Sure. Yep. Yeah. yeah, think of this as so, a set in the record, right? Yeah. Yeah, because you guys brought up this stuff. Like, you know, I like how you watched, uh, which was the one that you just watched, the, the it, recently one? It, Ian um, Carroll and Danny Jones. Those were the two I that Ian I found Carroll. you on, yeah. Ian Carroll, amazing guy. Yeah. Super, super smart. I think he's literally the number one investigative journalist on the planet right now. Like, <laughs> I, you know, just in terms of what he's doing, you know, like he reminds me of like, he's like a young Kobe Bryant in the NBA, just putting up numbers. <laughs> he is know? putting up numbers. Um, <laughs> he really, it's just really impressive talking to him. We went over these defense intelligence agency papers that talk about wormholes and warp drives, and he had obviously read them yeah. and he was like versed on them and impressed the heck out of me. Uh, definitely a guy that I look up to. So I'm glad that people watch that. And if people are watching this and want to watch that, please do, because we dug into a lot of really amazing information. Um, and then the Danny Jones thing would be like the exact opposite end of the spectrum. Uh, and in terms of that, it honestly makes me wonder, because of when that went down, when I was like on this rise, it, it makes me wonder if like this wasn't literally a setup from the beginning in terms of going into those interviews. Like I did the Tony Merkel Confessionals podcast was the first in-person one I ever did. And then... I had Julian Dory and Danny Jones messaging me to do other in-person ones like about a month later. And I didn't know this at the time, but they're best friends. Um, and they both set me up to like, ha they didn't tell me ahead of time or anything, like set me up to try to debunk the case like while I was there with them. And it's very obvious when you watch either of them. Uh, Julian Dory deleted his YouTube one uh, after the fact because he had so much negative response because when you come off disingenuous like that, people can tell when you're seeing it. And sure, I'm sure his super fans, you know, goes over their head. But for the people that are normal people that are watching, they're going, why is this guy being such a dick to this guy who's yeah. just an honest guy trying to get the information out there? And why is he trying to cherry pick all these insignificant details to try to like, aha him, you know, like, and the worst part was when you watch their other interviews, they don't do that to anybody. Yeah, ever. yeah. Like this, Danny Jones had a guy on there saying he like, got like sexually assaulted by an alien and had a hybrid baby. <laughs> And you're like, he doesn't push back on him yeah, at all. At all right? And both these guys have CIA agents come on like every single week on their show. Yeah. So you're thinking yeah. this might and have been a like a disinformation campaign from behind the scenes, possibly? It wouldn't surprise me. And the thing is, it's not a situation where it's like Danny Jones is an operative. Yeah, you can't, you're not going to find this. It's more of like, there was, right? yeah, it's not like that. It's more of like you have people that are their friend, people that they trust, that they're people they make contacts with that tell them like this guy's full of shit. Like, don't you know, you should go hard on this guy. He's he's lying. He's a scam or whatever. Gotcha. And they basically both admitted that that happened, that they had, you know, half a dozen or a dozen people telling them that I, you know, I'm some scammer or whatever. People make up all kinds of fake stuff about me. 
And when people do that to you, then, you know, it, it, it can sink in. Um, and so I knew that after the Julian Dory thing, cause I, when I got into it at, right after we were done, like I knew I was set up from the beginning on that, uh, from the way he treated me, uh, the way he had these FBI agents, like on speakerphone, Jim Diorio, legendary FBI agent what? like in front of me. Like, I think he was like trying to like intimidate me. It was super weird. So goddamn weird. And he deleted that. You said, I felt like he was, he deleted yeah, he had, that. Oh, it's on. I think you can watch, listen to it on Spotify, but it's not on YouTube. He deleted it off okay. YouTube. Wow. Uh, because he also edited it like defamatorily as well, like move stuff around, try to make me look bad. Like I literally told him I was going to sue him. Um, and then he sends me this text message about like how he, he's like a rich thing and his family members know some super powerful lawyers and how they'll work for him for free. I'm like, the dude is like a spoiled little bitch. Yeah, like, yeah. Julian Dory <laughs> is literally Jersey Shore trash. Nobody should go on Keep his podcast. Keep it PG-13 here. <laughs> uh, hey, Jersey Shore trash, that's fair. You could say that. Okay, sorry about that. That's all right. <laughs> Uh, so you can edit that part out if you want, but yeah, I, I have no love for this guy whatsoever. And, um, you know, he mistreated me. And then after the fact as well, like he, he had it like ended up like not paying for my hotel. I don't think he knew how you like prepay for hotels and stuff like that. And so this became a whole thing as well. Where he was lying about this is a bunch of bullshit anyway. So after that, like, obviously he had told me that he was best friends with Danny Jones. So I was worried about even going on Danny Jones after that it was sure, like, sure. You know, I don't want to get trapped again like this. And Danny kind of gave me some assurances that it wouldn't happen. And Julian had talked about how a major studio was going to recreate the videos. Like, he was, like, taunting me. And this mm. isn't on the podcast, but he was, like, taunting me after the fact. And I'm just like, what is wrong with this guy? And uh, turns out, like, it was the Corridor Crew. Yeah. I had never even heard of who they are because they're just some random YouTubers I that don't matter in this world. But, you know, if you're, like, a little kid or whatever, you, you know the, the Corridor Crew because they make, like, little cartoon videos and stuff like this or whatever on YouTube and just appeal to, like, Zoomers and stuff like that. Um, and it turns out that they're major debunker players as well. Like, all the debunkers know them, apparently, and they debunked the, U the, the Navy videos that we were talking about earlier as well. I watched their video on that after the fact. Um, and that's when on, on Danny Jones, like, Danny Jones also did me really dirty as well, not as overtly, uh, but he – he had like a fake break in the middle of it where he's like, okay, let's take a break and take the headphones off and stuff. Yeah. And then like, he's like plays that in the interview. And I'm like, wait, what dude? Like, that's so weird. Like, what are you trying to catch me in a spot where like, I was going to like let my guard down and admit that I was making it up the whole time or something like that. I don't know what he was thinking with that. It was so weird. It's so interesting. You say that and I it, noticed that and I wouldn't have put that together, but yeah, the way you say that, cause somebody came in in the middle and was like, uh, the internet's out again. Oh, let's take a break. Yep, and you both put them down, and they kept well, filming. Yeah. It was two times. So the, inter the the power did go out when I was with him, which was really weird. Like the power <laughs> actually went out. And then it came back up like 20 minutes later, and we started again. But then he also did this fake break where, like, I thought we were just having a break because we had gone for, like, an hour and a half or whatever. But, no, then he plays it. And I think he only cut out, like, the very end of our interview because I told him, like, don't edit it. Like, just – put it out there. I don't want you to be editing it. Maybe that's his excuse for the weird fake break. I don't know. But I saw him smiling near the end. Like he was giving me these smiles. I don't think you can tell when you watch it from the way they edited it. Uh, and I knew he had something planned. And that's when the Corridor Crew video comes out at the end where he plays this video. And it's so scummy to do something like that to somebody where you're going to like yeah. try to get them. And what I've learned is this for anybody who does podcasts, if you go on a podcast and they try to get you to sign a disclaimer, walk away immediately <laughs> yes. walk away if they're getting you to try to sign a disclaimer the intent is that they're trying to yeah they have full editorial control yeah yeah they want editorial control because they're afraid they're gonna get sued they want to try to get you so if that ever happens just walk off nobody the only one where i had to sign one was when i went on tim pool and that was mm. a uh, injury disclaimer because he's got a skate park on his lot so okay. no big person is going to make you sign a disclaimer um and then the video comes out and I was actually a little bit nervous because he's giving me these weird smiles. And I'm like, oh, did they, did they recreate the videos? Like, that would be, <laughs> that's going to make me look terrible if they were able right, to, like, right. perfectly recreate the videos and I can't tell the difference. But no, it's just this idiot Nico looking super cocky and confident. And he's just reading off the Metabunk forum. Yeah. And I'm like, wait, he's supposed to be a VFX expert. But everything he was saying, I could tell right away, wasn't even his own ideas. It was just literally from Mick West, who's, like, the number one debunker on the planet who runs this website, Metabunk. And I was just like, I had a smile on my face because I'm like, oh, I already know all these debunks. Like, I, every, anything that's been out there, I was already well versed in. Yeah. You know, so he's listing this stuff off, and every single thing he said is wrong. Like, literally every single thing. So I start typing, and I'm like, I got to take notes because 
I'm afraid that they're going to edit it. And I want to make sure I get this all down in case they edit me deceptively. I can get ahead of it. And Danny Jones, he's going, no, keep, keep looking exactly. at the screen. Keep looking at the screen. Excuse me. Are you paying attention? Ashton? And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He kept saying that. And the reason why is because he was, I knew what exactly what his intent was. He wanted to get me a shot, get it to a, a, such a shot where it made me look like I was looking nervous when I wasn't at all. I was not nervous, even a slight bit. Uh, cause the moment I realized there was no recreation, I realized, oh crap, these guys are total frauds. The quarter crew people are frauds. Like this video, I can refute every single thing he says. And I refuted every single point in that, in that, in that interview, I refuted every single point. Okay. And the number one point that they made is this VFX comparison, which, uh, the whole VFX comparison is like the biggest scam out there where this comes from Mick West, like a one day old Reddit account posted this way back in August of 2023 months before that interview. And they claim, well, this, this, this thing matches. It's gotta be a perfect match. This means that somebody must have used, uh, this, this stock effect in there. And the thing that you notice about anybody that pushes this is they show you the falsified comparison. A falsification means changing something for deceptive purposes. And then they compare the, the, the changed version of it. When you look at the unchanged version of it, you can tell right away it doesn't match. And it's only even remotely close on one frame. And then what we found recently is that this was actually uploaded on the internet back in January 25th of 2023, eight months before these videos got popular by a debunker. And the way we were able to prove that was because they took the comparison and they added it into what looked to be like a collage of the stock effects. And the only reason why someone would add that comparison in there is because they're a debunker who is, thinks that either these things match or, you know, it shows intent that somebody had uploaded this ahead of time to get ahead of this, of these videos getting out mm -hmm. there. And the fact that this was uploaded eight months before the videos got popular goes to show you that somebody was afraid and they wanted it out there. And we called out the person that uploaded it. And two days after I called them out, they went in there and they removed the comparison off of the collage. Hmm. So this was back like May 16th and I caught them. I went in the next day cause I was going to make a follow-up post and it wasn't there anymore. And I went, wait, how did somebody update this? This is like the internet archive. Well, it turns out if it's not the way back machine, it's just the internet archive. You can actually, and you're the person who uploaded it. You can actually go change it. Oh, interesting. And so they must've freaked out because they, I caught them when they're intent. And I said, then I said, okay, well, if you are a, uh, if you're somebody who's just an honest person, you should now come out and say who you are and why you uploaded this on the internet, January 25th of 2023 months before these videos got popular, because otherwise the only way to find these effects was on a CD ROM drive somewhere that nobody had <laughs> even the corridor crew later on yeah. admitted they didn't even have this effect. All of these debunkers had to download it from that location. That's where they all got yeah. it. And you realize, Whoa, this is getting really sketchy now. And then if you go look at this, this is a perfect overlay of the one frame. This is the best possible good faith representation it, the best possible orientation of the one frame that is similar is what we're looking at right here. And you can tell not even the edges line up Yeah. like right here where I have my mouse, this edge is inverted compared to what it is on the outside. And you can tell that this is the best comparison because this is where the big dot matches up right over here. Yeah. So the light colors and are the stock effect overlaid on the dark colors, correct. which is directly from the thermal video. And they don't. Exactly. I mean, you, you can see, see the, the outline is just slightly off on the corners. I mean, I would say in the middle, though, is, it's close, but it's not exact. Sorry. If you're going to have an exact, it's exact. It's not. Yeah. And the middle is not even remotely the same. Like yeah. the middle, there's no way to get this. And then anytime you bring this up and this is why I would bring up the comparison, and say, well, how many pixels match? Because if you try to tell somebody how many pixels match in this comparison, it's going to be a very small number of pixels to match, much less than even 50%. Yeah. And the debunkers don't want to admit that because they're trying to present this narrative that it's a perfect match when it's not. And then if you, if you push this situation, they'll say, well, you don't understand how VFX works, which is funny because then what I say in comparison is, well, this exact stock effect, which uh, I'll show you the other one now as well. Cause then what I did, like the biggest thing that breaks down the disinformation is when you show the full video effect, not just the one frame, right. but the full video effect perfectly lined up over it. This is where people then begin to realize like, oh, I've been lied to. Okay. So this is the full one. So right here, this is the one frame that I was just showing you yeah. the closest match. And then the rest of the frames, it's not even, I mean, not even close, it's not even the right number of frames. So this is not a situation where it's just put it in there. And yeah. Then what happens is the debunkers say, well, you don't know how stock effects work. 
And the irony is I, apparently I know how stock effects work better than VFX experts because <laughs> the whole point of a stock effect is that you just put it in there. You don't have to do any work on it. You don't have to completely change it. If you had to completely change it, you would just make your own effect. It's just a circle. It's not like it's yeah. some ingenious thing that you would have to create. And so what we did was we found five different locations where this stock effect was used in major media and never one time has it ever been modified. Mm. So Killing Time video game, the one that they originally found it in, there was an Attack on Titan advertisement. Attack on Titan's a giant anime that was there. Right, right. Um, the third one was uh, Starship Troopers, cult classic movie mm. from the 90s. <laughs> uh, Eastbound and Down, which was a giant movie with Danny McBride, or TV, TV show, show with Danny Kenny McBride Powers, on HBO. Yeah. yeah. Yes, on that one, they, they do do a modification to it. They slightly change the orientation of it like this. Really? But they don't they don't change the the background or they don't change the color. They don't they don't make it match like we do here to anything. What like kind that. of blue and blue the explosion last... does Danny McBride have in that show? I remember uh, he... he was doing some kind of batting thing, yeah, so, and so like then for some reason they used like this advertisement. Effect. Was... Yeah, and they just like yeah yeah. It was like he was making like a humorous, commercial or yeah. something. <laughs> You've seen it, yeah. <laughs> And then the last one was Anchorman, the movie Anchorman, where when he talks, like his eyes have these like explosions come on them, and it's, it's that effect. Mm -hmm. And so I can say, I believe at this point is a statement of fact that this effect has never been modified in any major media. It might never have been modified ever in the ways that the debunkers are arguing that it's been modified in this. Are, are, I mean, aren't um, they just ask, are basically arguing that like you, it was taken from this to like that, right? You're just kind of like warping it slightly. Isn't that what they're, which, which what that you they, would, they, yeah. They underestimate. They they claim, oh, well, it's just it's just a warping effect. But no, you can tell from looking at the middle of that one frame. There's no warping that's going to make that middle match, no matter what. Yeah, and if you're warped, and this is the, the one frame wouldn't it. align. If you're warping it. And so what you can also say to them, and this is for everybody out there who's watching, when when the debunkers say that this thing matches, you just say, well, give me a list of steps, a recreation steps. Give me the list of exact steps that I could follow, that I could get it to be a 100% pixel perfect match. And they'll say, well, I don't know what that person did. Well, you're the one saying that it's a perfect match. So mm -hmm. if, if you don't know what they did to make it match, how, how can you say that it's a match? Um, and this is just basic logic. This isn't you know anything special. And this goes to your point also of leads into the point of what is the motivation yeah. for the person who would have faked this to begin with? Like you need to have an understanding of physics that most PhDs don't understand about. I mean, you listen to what we just spoke about with the physics side of it. Engineering of the plane. There was somebody that posted on Reddit when this was like first going viral that claimed to be the top VFX expert of Top Gun Maverick, the movie from 2022 with Tom Cruise. And they said the hardest part about that movie was getting the plane scaled down to have the accurate speed. And when you watch the recreation attempts by the debunkers, you can tell right away that it's, they can't figure out how to make the plane turn correctly and look correct. Because that's like the scaling down the movement of the plane is like the hardest part. And they have something to copy when they're doing it. Right, well. right. Yeah, they have reference frames, um, yeah. So you need engineering background because that's a real that's a real Boeing triple seven. We're seeing those videos performing a real turn, uh, and then you'd also have to have the VFX skills and enough VFX skills to fool all the experts because there's no discrepancies anywhere, no errors anybody can find. Right. And you also have to have the knowledge of the military systems that nobody knew, especially in 2014. And this all has to be done with software from 2014 in a 3D render environment and hardware. So none of it makes any sense. And somebody made a post too about like the psychological motivations for somebody who is doing this. And uh, one of the big things is that Regicide Anon, who uploaded it, it was published May 19th, 2014, nine, eight days before that raw telemetry data. It says received March 12th, 2014 in his video. That's four days after the plane disappeared. That was before the United States intelligence services started floating the South Indian Ocean narrative. Mm. So you're like, if, unless register, they like in order for any story, full comprehensive story to make sense, you have to begin with regicide Anon potentially being the hoaxer. Because if regicide Anon is not the hoaxer, why you have to make up a, a reason for why they're lying about when they received the video, right? Or found right? this because random if they received guy it March twelfth. Yeah. yeah, and that's where they like. This is where you can catch the bunkers right away. Is that this is why they refuse to present any comprehensive story. They also refuse to try to find the hoaxer. Because they know that there isn't a hoaxer. Like in the, at least in the back of their minds, they know they're never going to find a hoaxer. The ultimate irony, too, is that cloud picture saga as well. Is that cloud picture was uploaded on an obscure website called CG Textures. Supposedly that's where it originated. Um, there's no actual proof that it uh, predates the videos. Um, there was a detailed analysis by Bobby O with an underscore at the end of his name on Twitter, if you guys want to find it, um, where he showed that they searched multiple sources on the internet. 
there is no proof. I even talk to the, the textures website owner. They changed their name from CG textures to textures and they just conveniently wiped all their servers for all the data before these videos existed. So there's actually no proof whatsoever, no hard evidence that these, that cloud picture even existed before these videos existed out there. The CG, so we looked on the torrents, this image doesn't, this cloud image doesn't exist on any torrents, which means the only way they could have got the cloud image would have been from that old website. Well, this old website was an obscure website and this is a random cloud picture that uh, out of like a hundred and something different sets. And we have a narrow time of s less than 70 days. So there's got to be less than five people that downloaded this image in that period of time, maybe even like none practically. So why, and all, and all these people, even Mick West literally knows the textures.com owner. He actually admitted that in his skeptical inquirer article. I posted that the other day as well. So if Mick, Mick West knows the owner, why aren't they trying to figure out which of the five people that downloaded this image is the hoaxer? Cause it can only be them. The image doesn't exist anywhere else. Yeah. They literally would have had to download it from that website. Wow. Interesting. This is, again, just goes to show you there isn't a hoaxer. Yeah. Yeah. Or they have no motivation to actually crack it. I mean, that's, that's what's compelling. Yeah, I think true. when you go, uh, in fact, you said it or Ian said it on the show that you did with him, the fact that you come out and you can talk for an hour or two hours or even three hours in many cases, you know, the story's not changing. The, the story's actually developing, right? You're getting, oh, here's this extra piece, here's this, this extra piece, and you can add it into the puzzle. But, right, if you were some sort of hoaxer, I mean, I always go back to election interference, right? All of these people like Rudy Giuliani, his story just kept changing and changing and changing. And he became yeah. an incredible source. And it, it's it, it gets to a certain point. But, hey, Ashton, listen, it's been an hour and a half. It's been a really awesome conversation. The only piece yeah. of you know wisdom, I can't give you any wisdom, obviously, but I've been in the Twitter sphere. I've only got 15,000 followers. <laughs> You've got me beaten by 10x in less than a year. But in three years of being in this kind of, I'll call it contentious space that I've been in, and, and getting labeled conspiracy theorists and all of this stuff, you know, it, it is difficult. It's difficult to keep your wits about you. It's difficult to keep engaging in good faith yeah. conversations. And I, I hope that you're able to do that because a lot of people that I had been in touch with and, you know, orchestrated these ideas together, they've gone away. They've either deleted their accounts, they've stopped worrying about it, or they've been <laughs> put in jail because they were at the January 6th protest. But my point in saying that is there's also a lot of people out there that take this information and use it like it's gospel. And that's one thing that I just want to caution you is a lot of people are going to listen to what you say, you present it very clearly, and they're going to run and say, wow, this is no questions. And a lot of the stuff, there is no questions. But you, you know, it's, it's, about, it's about taking the lowest common denominator in your following right the guy who's running around on my side saying they stuffed the ballot boxes 2000 mules yeah. you got to say hey that is not the credible part let's look at what the credible parts are and it's parsing that and and communicating that message clearly that's been such a difficult thing and actually like i said at the beginning i don't feel that problem's been fixed so it's just another example of the u.s government could potentially pull these strings pull these levers do these things and do we ever get the result that we actually expect or that we know full well is what's happening you never really know sometimes. So with that, brother, thank you very much. You're welcome on this show anytime. Seriously, I know Mike and I have talked about maybe going into a little deeper on this, but if there's any kind of, you know, avenue you'd like us to look into, we like to look and read and research. So we're happy to help you. But um, hey, happy Memorial Day, Ashton. And thank you again. Seriously, it's been fun. Yeah, I just want to say too, you know, thanks for that advice. I, I do try to teeter the line in terms or toe the line in terms of I'm not trying to make a cult of believers. Right. And I don't want I'm not trying to start a movement against taking down the government or anything like that. <laughs> I, I actually even wonder about like, should I even be revealing this information? It makes our country less safe. I, I do inherently worry about that. Um, so I, I do try to make sure that I don't have people that are like getting way too obsessed over it in general. And if people do see that behavior, uh, you know, let me know so I can try to tap it down. I am trying to keep this very level headed, very, uh, um, you know, by the evidence and by the numbers. This is also why I don't dig into other conspiracies. Everyone wants me to tie this to 9-11 or MH17, which is another plane that disappeared. Uh, people want me to look into a lot of the esoteric aspects as well. Um, and that's why I, I don't do any of that stuff is that I'm really trying to keep it tight and focused. Yeah. And if this does lead to discoveries for all that other stuff, great. You know, I support everybody, all independent uh, investigators and journalists that are out there. Yeah. So thank you guys very much for this opportunity. I appreciate it. You rock, Ashton. Thank you again.